So now what we have coming along is not the software, but the open source hardware. And the Open Source Hardware Association was formed last year. They created the first version of the open source definition, just uh, open source hardware definition, just like there's an open source definition for software. And that's all happening really fast. And there are a lot of lessons for them to learn from the open source software community. And if any of you are involved in the hardware community, uh, I'm really interested in building more bridges between the open hardware and the open software because so much of it has already been figured out. And I feel like the open hardware community in a lot of ways is trying to start from scratch. Uh, but the open hardware is where a lot of the business is really going to start to change because we have things like the Arduino and the Raspberry Pi, and I'll be talking about the Pi more this afternoon. And 3D printing in particular has taken the cost of prototyping a tangible object from tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of dollars a few years ago to uh, I can do it in 10 minutes with a $500 printer that's sitting on my desk. And that's a huge change for how a business is going to work. There's a great book that just came out uh, called The Maker Manifesto by the CEO of Tech Shop. And Tech Shop is a chain of uh, maker spaces in the US. And so that's a place you can go and they have everything from a CNC machine to a laser cutter to a sewing machine. Everything you could possibly want to make something with. And so he wrote this book called The Maker Manifesto about this culture and about how it's having such a huge impact on people starting businesses. They can walk into a tech shop and have a prototype in an afternoon and go sell it the next day. And that's a business. It's something that would have taken at least a year and your entire life savings a few years ago. But it's not just, so this is a, for the Doctor Who fans, it's a little 3D printed TARDIS. It's actually about this big. It's one of my favorite things to print. And I think that's what a lot of people think the 3D printers for are for, is for fun, for printing little TARDISes and octopus and everything else cute. But the step after that is bioprinting. And this is a really fascinating field. So what this demonstrates with the diagram is, this is how you print an artery. And uh, someone asked one of the researchers at Clemson University who's working on one of these bioprinters. The bioprinters themselves aren't open yet, but he said, uh, what's the difference between your bioprinter and my Lulzbot or whatever 3D printer you have on your desk? And he said, essentially the materials I'm printing. That's the difference. And so what this is, is you lay down a layer of biogel and then a little ring of cells. And another layer of biogel and a ring of cells. You're printing cells, which just kind of makes my head explode every time I say it. But after a few hours, it cures, it solidifies, and you have an artery. And the next step after that is we start printing bones and organs. And that's a huge impact on people's lives. And I'll talk more about that in a second. So the maker spaces, which I briefly touched on, is where a lot of this is coming out of. And I asked someone last night if there was such a place here, and he said, no, that there's not one in this town. But uh, they're, they're spreading fast, and so I would encourage those of you who live here who don't have one to, to look into ways to start one. We there do. is? You do? Yes. So somebody lied. Yes. I'm so happy for you. <laughs> I'm glad you do. What's it called? Uh, wow. Awesome. Uh, so this is a picture of a sea base in Berlin, and it's one of the oldest. It's about 20 years old, which is long before most of us even thought about maker spaces and hacker spaces. And one of my favorite things about Sea Base in Berlin is it has this whole mythology around it about being a crash space station and there's aliens and all of this great stuff to go along with it. But uh, hackerspaces.org is a great list for those of you who don't live here who want to find your local one. So let's talk about some more of what that 3D printing is doing besides making cool TARDISes. Uh, these are just a couple of stories from March. This all, the next three uh, images all happened in about a week. This is how fast this is all happening. Somebody got a replacement skull. A little boy got a new hand, thanks to a 3D printer. And then we started printing stem cells. And it was about a week after this, uh, if you remember the story about the kid who, this was in the US, they printed a new trachea for the kid and uh, pushed it through FDA approval in a, just a day or something, which is absurd. That doesn't happen in the US, and I still don't know how they did it, but it was amazing. This is literally, it, it's saving people's lives. It's changing people. And that means that we're also changing the business model. And it's going from the tangible things through the open data, through the transparency, and it's changing how business functions. So it's no longer just about your code. It's how your business acts, and it's how you interact with other people. So simply, not sharing is no longer an option. And so I'm going to tell you a few examples from things like education and healthcare and how some other businesses are doing this. So let's start with Open Student. Uh, in British Columbia, they discovered that their student record system for all of the schools in British Columbia was going to be discontinued in 2015. And that meant they had sunk $89 million into a software system that they could no longer use. 
And that's what happens when your format can't translate to another program. And so they decided to start over. They scrapped their $89 million program and started from scratch. And the people in British Columbia built it for themselves and then opened the data, or, or opened the code. And it's called Open Student so that other school systems can use it. Uh, it costs a mere fraction. I mean, just pocket change compared to the old $89 million system. And it's much bigger. It's not just a student record system. Parents can log in and track their students' progress. And it put more money back into the local economy because it was built by people locally. In the U.S., the Obama administration has called for all students to have digital textbooks by 2017. And I'm going to be really interested to see whether that happens, because just about nobody has started yet. Uh, the last I checked, California and Florida, which is two out of 50 states, have started on digital textbooks. And it's 2013 and 2017, not so far away. Uh, but one state that, that got ahead of California and Florida is Utah. Utah started testing this in 2010, before this mandate came out. And they initially tested it with 2,000 students with uh, just a certain grade set of high schoolers and their science textbooks. They started using ck12.org for their digital textbooks. And it went so well, they decided to expand the program to all 6th through 12th graders, that's about uh, 11 through 17 or 18 year olds, throughout Utah. And so now for their language arts, their math, and their science books for their last six years of school, they have uh, <coughs> textbooks that cost them $3.73 per student. At that price, they're considered completely consumable. They're expendable items. The kids, if they have printed versions, they can color on them, they can highlight on them, they can make notes in them, they can use digital copies on their Kindles, they can do whatever they want with them because those textbooks cost nothing. Uh, if, if the American money doesn't translate well for you, $3.73 per student, uh, your average textbook at that level is probably at least $100 for one book, much less to color all, cover all those subjects for $3.73. And so these are just a handful of the places that you can get the open textbooks. There are gobs more. It's expanding every day. What subjects you can get, what levels you can get, and, and even if you just want to do it for personal learning, you can go download those. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of Khan Academy. This is the most words I've ever put on a slide, I'm really sorry, but these were just such fantastic quotes about what people have gotten out of Khan Academy. They've had 250 million views of Khan Academy videos now. And that's people who, in a lot of cases, can't afford a traditional education, but they're learning because of this open coursework. MIT, however, uh, really pioneered the whole open coursework idea. It's been around 12 or 13 years now. They, uh, they saw that this whole internet education thing was coming. And instead of wait for it to come and then try to figure out how to deal with it, they got ahead of it. And so a group at MIT went to the administration and said, um, I know that we're kind of an exclusive school and people pay a lot of money here. We'd like to just give away all of our courses for free on the internet. Okay. And, and the idea that someone said yes to that is just utterly fantastic. But they did. And so now you don't get an MIT degree at the end of it, but you get the information. And that's what changes people, and that's what gives them the next step into whatever they do. And I think there's a future coming where that, that piece of paper is going to have a different value as people are finding these alternate educational means. We're not there yet, but um, I can certainly see it coming. They get a million and a half hits a month now on MIT OpenCourseWare. About 43% of them are not students. They're just people who want to come learn something. Uh, these are a, a handful of other similar online courseware places if you're interested in going and learning. Um, Codecademy is fun. I've learned all sorts of things on there. So let's talk about uh, open healthcare. And a lot, of, a lot of what I'm going to explain, the, my perspective of healthcare is obviously from an American one, and uh, our healthcare is not the best system in the world. And so we pay a lot of money for mediocre at best healthcare. And that's changing. Uh, one of the biggest problems is if I say have three doctors and maybe I was hospitalized and I saw a specialist over here. Now we've got five people connected to my healthcare and none of them have any connection to each other. Those healthcare records don't travel. Unless you physically go to your doctor and say, I would like my records and I would like to walk them over to the next guy and I would like to take all of his and walk them over to the next guy. That's the only way your records are traveling. Some of that's changing. Uh, open EMR, open healthcare records, uh, it's, it's amazing how fast the healthcare is changing. But where it really gets interesting is in personal data sharing. And there's this movement that's known as the quantified self. 
and it takes all of this personal data tracking and then starts to tie it into not only your healthcare, but healthcare for everyone. And so here's where it starts, is with some of the devices. And uh, you've probably seen this one, this is a Fitbit, it's the world's most expensive pedometer essentially. Uh, it clubs on your belt and counts how many steps you've walked, it also will function as an alarm clock and trash your sleep, but it costs about $100 and it's a pedometer. I still have one, but I think it might be a little pricey. This is a glucose monitor, this is for diabetics. It measures your glucose and carb intake and then uh, connects to an app on your iPhone to tell you how you're doing. This, however, this is the crazy one. Does anybody know what these are? These are made by a company called Proteus. They're smart pills. Now, uh, in, in the US at least, and I assume this is the sort of number that translates pretty universally, uh, about 50% of people on medicine do not take it the way they're supposed to. They skip doses, they just, forget, they don't bother, whatever reason. Anything from, I don't really want to take that to I can't afford my medicine. About half of people just simply don't take it. And then they don't tell their doctor. And if you don't tell your doctor that you didn't take your medicine, he can't really help you. So what this does, it's powered by your stomach fluids. So it doesn't need a battery, you swallow that, and it tells your doctor if you took your medicine or not. And it's FDA approved. So then we start talking about what happens when you share your data. There is a man named Salvatore, you know, I'm not Italian, I can't pronounce his name. Yaconezzi, I believe. Anyway, he had brain cancer, uh, which is not affected by whether or not I can say his name. And he realized that when you have a disease like this, then you become a set of records. You're no longer a person who has a disease, you're just a bunch of information on paper. And so when he was diagnosed, he asked for his records, and he walked out of the doctor's office and he posted all of those records online. And he said, here's what's wrong with me, can anybody help? Because the doctor sure can. Sounds a little crazy. 200,000 people went and checked out his health records. 90 of them were doctors. A few of them helped him. Now he's in remission. That is not a scalable plan. I do not recommend posting all of your health records online. I do recommend services like these. These are two sites where people come together and share information about their own health care to help others. Uh, patients like me is in particular interesting because of what they've been able to do with the data. Because of all of this quantity of sharing, they've been able to prove links that traditional research has not because of how complicated, how expensive, other issues with traditional research. But when people simply come together and start talking about their issues, the data comes through. So the first example of this was in uh, 2009 they proved a link between infertility and asthma. They saw that people who reported infertility were 1.9 times more likely to report asthma as well. And it was something that had always been suspected but never proven. And so then a year later, they repeated the study with 4,000 people's records and proved it again, uh, along with an additional link to endometriosis. And so they've been repeating this again and again, creating an alternative to traditional medical research with people's shared data. And obviously, I can't go on and say, I would like to know what's wrong with Bob Smith. It's all depersonalized, aggregated data, which is uh, especially important to, pay, uh, to Cure Together. I talked about this backwards, sorry. Cure Together was founded by two brothers whose third brother had ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. And they just wanted to kind of help him out. They wanted to help him find other people with the problem. Because you know, when you're sick, you kind of wonder, is this headache normal or is that something else? Do other people who take this drug have rapid heartbeat? You know, it, it, are these things normal? That's a common wonder. And so they founded the site for their brother to find other people with ALS. And then what they ended up with was a site where people shared a whole lot of other information. And they called themselves a for-profit company with a non-profit attitude. So there's no advertising. And the way they make money is they sell the aggregated, depersonalized, no personal information at all data to pharmaceutical companies and medical device companies so that they can get more information about the kind of people that they're selling to. Uh, but this one, this is uh, my, my best story in the arsenal of reasons why openness is important. And it's someone else's story. It's Karen Sandler. She is now the executive director of the GNOME Foundation. At the time, she worked for the Software Freedom Law Center. And she discovered that she had a heart problem that put her at risk of sudden cardiac death, which is exactly as horrible as it sounds. And so they said, well, there's a solution. You get a pacemaker, relatively common device. You just put the pacemaker on your heart, take care of the problem. And she said, okay, can I see the source code that it runs on? 
Like, well, absolutely not. This is a proprietary device with proprietary software on it. We're not going to let you see the source code. So she went to the three major companies that uh, make the pacemakers and asked each of them. She said, I'll sign an NDA. I simply want to see the code that is responsible for saving my life. And they all said no. And so the Medical Device Security Center did a study. And what they discovered was that for uh, several implanted devices like this, all you needed essentially was what I carry in my backpack, a laptop and a radio antenna and very little other equipment. And you could not only get data off of these devices, but you could send electrical shocks and stop someone's heart. I could do that to anyone sitting in this room right now who has a face maker. And that is why openness is important. Uh, the source code for these devices is, at least in the US, not reviewed by the FDA unless the company who makes it requests that they review their code. Who's going to do that? Hey, could you see if there's anything wrong with this? That seems likely. So let's talk about business. Because uh, like I said at the beginning, we learn to share as children. And then somewhere along the way we forget. And then when we start businesses, we start thinking, but this is mine. I don't want to share mine. I don't want to share my business. But it turns out that's often really useful. So Whole Foods is a grocery store in the US. It's based in Austin, uh, and it's kind of, it has a reputation for being sort of a hippie, crunchy, the name is Whole Foods. It's where you get the organic and natural sorts of things. So Whole Foods shares everything. You can go, if you are a stock boy putting cans of soup on the shelves, you can go find out what your boss's boss makes. It's all written down in a book. Everybody's salary data is shared, all of their sales data, all of their profits, every single bit of information is shared. And so uh, every employee is considered an insider for the purposes of stock trading because they know everything. And so the way it's built, it's, it's created a culture of openness. And so beyond that, uh, if you work on a team at Whole Foods and you want to hire a new person on your team, two thirds of your team has to agree that they want to hire that person and that person gets a 30 day trial, at the end of which two thirds of your team still has to agree that they want a new person. And so things are, it, it makes more of a community culture than an employee hierarchy culture. This is a, a Red Hat story. So Red Hat has a mailing list that you're automatically subscribed to when you're hired. It's called Memo List. So every single person in the company is on the list. Now when Red Hat was a company of 40 people, that meant this list was for absolutely everything from who wants to get lunch with me to does anyone know who our sales contact at IBM is? It was everything. And that works when you have a company of 40 people all sitting in the same room. When you have a company of 4,000 people spread around the world, nobody cares in India if I'm going to lunch in the US. <laughs> So people started objecting to the volume of messages coming through the list. And a lot of them were completely off topic for the company. There was a lot of talk about bacon. I got a reputation for being the bacon girl. I'm, I'm okay with that. By the way, Croatia, you have lovely bacon. Uh, so they decided that something needed to be done. They didn't want to lose this culture because memo list was an important part of the Red Hat culture, an important part of openness. If you do something not openly at Red Hat, you're going to hear about it on memo list the next day because somebody's going to call you out on it and ask you why you didn't share, why you didn't talk about it before you did. And that was, that was a huge part of the culture, incredibly important. And so they didn't want to simply kill the mailing list. So what they did was they gathered a group of all the people who uh, posted most frequently on the list, asked for volunteers if anybody else wanted to join this group, and got this group together to come up with a solution. And the solution was called Friday List. And the reason it's called Friday List was because a lot of the more flame war sorts of topics on memo list would always start with, I know it's not Friday, but dot, 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 because apparently Friday is the day when you're allowed to yell at people. I don't know. Uh, and so now we have a separate list. Friday List is opt-in. You subscribe if you want to for the bacon and the funny videos and all the other stuff. Memo List, you can only post to if it is actually of interest to all 7,000 employees. That's the baseline rule for memo list now. And so we both saved the culture and the fantastic bacon. NASA is uh, my favorite example of open government. And uh, there, there are sort of really interesting examples from around the world of open government initiatives. And that's a whole other talk for another day. But uh, I'll just use NASA because before this, uh, if you had suggested to me that I would read a 107-page government report cover to cover, I probably would have thought you were crazy. 
But I read NASA's 107 page open government report because what it does is tell you about everything that the space program is working on and explains to you on three principles how they're being open about it. Uh, you can go to code.nasa.gov and their code is open source. And these are the five uh, open government principles <coughs> that they work on that you can read about in the report that they explain uh, each of their projects based on. And the reason that NASA leads the way in this is because all the way back in 1958 when they were chartered, they were chartered with the mission to uh, provide for the widest practical dissemination of information. That essentially means that in 1958, NASA was ordered to be open source, to find a way for the widest possible spread of information, which in 1958 was a pretty radical concept, and they've built on it ever since then. And so the common denominator through all of this is success through sharing. Each of these companies, these healthcare projects, all of these things, they succeeded because they shared. So now let's talk about sharing data, sharing things that you create. And this is also a, a rather US-centric example, but the lesson is universal. We have a problem in the US. It's called the public domain black hole. Because we have extended copyright so much, Nothing new will enter the public domain now until 2019. So in any given year, anything that should enter the public domain does so on January 1st. So nothing new in any year until 2019. The reason this is a problem is because, uh, so as you can see, this is a gross oversimplification of US copyright law now, but essentially 95 years for copyright, which is long beyond your personal need for copyright over anything you've created. And the reason this is a problem is because that prevents anyone from creating any sort of translations. You can't even make a braille translation of a book so that blind people can read it. It prevents you from uh, distributing guitar taps for music or adapting books to film, anything that requires that copyright permission. One of the problems that I think is most interesting is uh, it prevents you from preserving old film. Uh, so films before about 1951, were made on cellulose nitrate film. Cellulose nitrate, when applied to cotton, is called gun cotton because it explodes. It catches on fire very easily. You don't even need to light it on fire. It often will do it all by itself. If you saw the movie Inglorious Bastards at the end, big conflagration of film, that was cellulose nitrate. That was the whole point of that storyline. Uh, they didn't really need to light it on fire. They could have just waited. It would have happened eventually. And so all of the films before 1951 are being completely lost. Another one every day. So even if it doesn't catch on fire, it degrades very quickly. Uh, all, almost all of the silent film era that hasn't been preserved has been lost already. And so uh, there's this concept called orphan works. And orphan works essentially means we don't know who owns the copyright, and thus we have to pretend that it has one. So even if whoever once owned that copyright to that 1940 book or movie has been long dead and hasn't cared since he died in 1960, we can't preserve it. We can't create new works from it. We might never be able to. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll skim past Disney really fast. We could talk uh, all afternoon over lunch about how I feel about Disney and copyright, but essentially Disney is what has caused this problem with copyright law in the US because every time Mickey Mouse's copyright is going to expire, they lobby Congress for an extension. However, they have no problem taking from the public domain. This is just a brief list of Disney movies and the public domain works that they were created off of. So let's talk about music real quick. Uh, and I'll talk faster because I think I'm running out of time. If, uh, this may not interest a lot of you as much because it's very much about US copyright law, but if that is interesting, the Center for the Public Domain has produced a couple of comic books that explain copyright law. Uh, but what's really fascinating about it is it talks about how old this history is. And basically, Plato was opposed to mashups. He said, uh, any musical innovation is in danger of the whole state and must be prohibited. It's actually any musical innovation or gymnastic, I believe, which is an amusing combination. Uh, if you're familiar with the band Tears for Fears, the song Everybody Wants to Rule the World, half of Tears for Fears, those two guys, now creates all of his music under a Creative Commons license. Uh, are you guys all familiar with Creative Commons? Who's not? Awesome, we'll skip that. We can, two of you, we'll talk about Creative Commons later. Ghosts uh, was a Nine Inch Nails album that, uh, before its release, was not advertised in any fashion, except that Trent Reznor posted on their website uh, something like two weeks, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. That was the entirety of the advertisement. 
And then in two weeks, they posted all of the songs for download. You could also purchase them in various forms, up to a $300 ultra special edition limited deluxe something something. $300. So, you can have the songs for free, or you can have the songs for $300, or anything in between. And I think that 10 years ago, most people would have said, you're not going to make any money off of that, because everybody's going to get those for free. It cost them $20,000 in site upgrades over the weekend, because they made $2 million and took down the site. Further proving you can make money off this free stuff. Now is the part where I just start telling you fun things from pop culture about how open source works. Uh, this is from the Tron Legacy, the sequel that came out a couple years ago. Uh, and they actually, you can see Linux in the beginning. It essentially is an open source story. We can debate for a while about whether he should have released the code in the beginning of the movie, but that's essentially what happens, is the guy who releases the code takes it and releases it on the internet. And then arguably the entire rest of Tron is about code trying to escape on its own. This is about how all this works in fashion design. Uh, who thinks this is the same dress twice? What's different? Who can tell me what's different? The hair. What? It's not the same time. Oh, the era. Okay. Do you know? Do you know what this is? This is from Harry Potter. This is uh, this is the wedding scene where Bill and Fleur get married. Harry Potter. This is an Alexander McQueen runway dress. They are not the same dress. And so when this is older. So when Alexander McQueen said, "Hey, Harry Potter costume designer, I think you kind of stole my dress." Costume designer said, "Oh no no no." As you can clearly see, my dress uses phoenixes, whereas yours has peacocks. They're not the same at all. And there's almost no intellectual property protection in fashion design, uh, because fashion is, is considered functional. You, there are only so many ways to put two sleeves on a shirt. And yet, the fashion industry is still managing to make bucket loads of money. Amusingly enough, this is an earlier Alexander McQueen show. If you recall, they were just objecting to Harry Potter using their stuff. This was from the first Harry Potter movie. Alexander McQueen explicitly said they stole the chess scene from the first Harry Potter movie for one of their shows. I don't think you can have it both ways. Just coming around again, these are uh, from the new Harry Potter movie. So uh, this is a McQueen dress and uh, the, the Hunger Games one. These, so this one, this is where I think that they're likely, they haven't gotten in trouble yet and I'm not sure how. Uh, these are actually the same dress from Alexander McQueen. These are not the same dress, and yet, clearly there was some inspiration there. Now what all of these are, is uh, on the left you have the runway version of whatever the piece of attire is, the shirt or the dress, for say $400 to $1,000. The ones on the right are the ones that appear about a week later in a store called Forever 21 for about $10 to $40. And there's not a whole lot they can do about it. This happens every time there's a new runway show. People get the knockoffs at the mall. Amazingly, again, all of those companies are still making bucket loads of money on their design versions. Skipping past fashion, how many of you have read this book? It's, uh, it came out in November 2011, I think. Uh, and I think they're making a movie out of it. If you enjoy 80s pop culture, 80s music, and movies, you should read this immediately. Uh, what I think is really interesting about it from an open source perspective is it's the first time that I really saw that term appear in a non-software, non-all uh, these other intentional uses of openness fashion. But I think he did it wrong. And so in the, in the book, there is this futuristic version of the internet. Everyone shops there, they uh, go to school there, they essentially live there because the real world has become so horrible. It's called the Oasis, and you interact with it with a pair of gloves and a pair of goggles. It's fully immersive. And he refers to the Oasis as open source. He uses those words. Except the entire point of the book is that it is not open source, and the company that holds the Oasis is evil. And so I, I noodled over this, uh, I thought about it a bit, about what he meant, and I, I think that this is really the first instance I've seen where someone uses open source to mean community, because the Oasis is the gathering place. And I think this is the first time that I'm seeing that, that leap where people are referring to open source as what, we, what I said in the beginning, that it's really about community and collaboration and togetherness. But my favorite example that you can use to explain how open source works 
to anybody who has no idea how your code works, is Iron Man. Uh, have you guys at least seen the Iron Man movies? Yes. Yeah? Awesome. So, uh, regardless of Iron Man's storyline, which comic book or movie version you're talking about, there's this base fact. He has a serious problem, he's got shrapnel about to go into his heart, and so he has to solve that problem. And that's what in open source software we call scratching your own itch. That's where a lot of open source software comes from. And so Tony Stark scratches his own itch and makes the first Iron Man suit. And it is ugly, but it does the job. It's just a big hunk of metal, and that's about all it does is get him out of his problem. But then he goes and he takes that and he improves on it. And he makes the second Iron Man suit and the third one. And I think by the most recent movie we have like 42 suits. Uh, and then somebody else takes his plans and they make a suit that they use against him. It's the entire story of open source code in an Iron Man suit. Also, as it turns out, Iron Man uses Linux in his heads up display. This is from Amazing Iron Man number 11 in 1998. Uh, and you can see, if you can't see, he's got KDE 3.5. So now you know Iron Man uses Linux. The last book I'll tell you about just came out earlier this year. Uh, do you guys know what Steampunk is? Yes. Okay. Uh, so for those of you who don't, uh, steampunk is this aesthetic in which we're re-envisioning the past. It's sort of a Victorian era with modern technology powered by steam. And it's had a huge resurgence that started in about 2005. And so this book was written by a futurist at Intel and a historian who used to be brain manager for the Xbox. And so we have this, this historian and this futurist who came together and said, what does steampunk mean about our technology? Why is this happening now? And what they concluded is that steampunk is a reflection of our desire for more openness, to go back to that time when we could fix our devices, when we could make things do what we wanted them to do. So if you have an iPhone in your pocket, you have a device that does for you what Apple wants it to do for you, not what you want it to do for you. And steampunk is a reaction against that. It's a return to wanting things to do for you what you need them to do, not what some designer somewhere needs to do. And they tie this all into the maker culture, maker fairs, uh, and, and that whole movement. And it's, it's just really fascinating. So that about uh, wraps it up. If you want to read more stories like this, that's what we found at opensource.com for. It has channels for business, education, government, health, law, and then the life channel is uh, kind of everything else. I talk about video games and Steam and things like that. And I'll leave you with that. Uh, five ways to go be open. Just find something to open, whether you're a writer or an artist or a coder or whatever you do. Just find some ways to be more open in something besides your code. Thanks.